and or the less water you're going to get per stroke. One or two, one or the other, or both of those is going to be the case. But 200 feet is considered the the maximum for most hand pumps. But there are some that can go down to 300, even 350 feet. It's just going to be a little harder. You're going to be a little more spendy, things like that. Um, but there are options out there for going deeper. And once again, I'm going to talk about this. Probably going to go over a lot of this in the class, but. It's not about how deep your well is, it's about the static water level. Where is the water level? Your well could be 500 feet deep, but the static water level could be 50 feet. So, yeah. Uh, I want to comment to my neighbor here about, uh, <coughs> about the fitting of everything. When I put my simple pump in about 15, 16 years ago, um, and, and then the bison was about it. There wasn't any, right. even by the local. Um, and the simple pump does have a 12 volt that can go on there. I don't know if there's a bison have it now. I think that they do actually. Okay. I, I'm not familiar with it. Was, well, what, what I was getting at was that when you are looking to put that alongside your existing pipe, mm -hmm. make sure that you take something like a, 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 a piece of PV, inch and a quarter PVC pipe and secure that with a fishing line. And if, if your casing is like this, Mark that mentally 12, 6, 3, 9, okay? And start dropping down straight. And you've got to have something that's about a foot long because they have these standoffs that support that pipe in the middle of that casing. And you want to get past these standoffs. Now, if you put just a weight on there, a fishing weight, then it's going to get tangled up and you don't know where you are. Okay, if you have something that's 12 inches or more longer, then it'll go down alongside. And at some point, you won't get it going straight down. So reel it back up. And move over a few degrees and go down until you, and mark that place so you know now before you start sinking hundreds of pounds <laughs> of pipe down there. <laughs> you know. the, the idea being that the well could be a little bit crooked and you want to find Well, not only that, you have the standoffs, okay? The little, little, little holders that keep that, it's like a like Mercedes or Peace Line or whatever, um, you know, three legged things that hold that pipe in the middle, the rubber holds it again, so it doesn't go up a tank but climb mm -hmm. inside. All right, so there's going to be a series of them. The more, the deeper your 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 pipe, the well, then the more of those you're going to have. You want a straight shot going down. So in other words, you don't want to drop it down here and then hit once. Okay, well I'll just wiggle a little bit and have it fall. No, you want a straight shot. That's why I even a three foot length will help you get a straight shot down without tangling things around. Does that make sense? Cool. Very yeah. good. Thanks, Russ. Appreciate that. Uh, one. Kind of a different subject. I, have, I put in a water catchment system last last summer. Betters come into 273 gallon totes. Mm -hmm. To get that to work with a hose, do you have to install a pump? Because I hooked up my hose to that and I turned it on and nothing's coming out of the hose. Well, it all depends on your elevation. You know, if, if the one end of the hose is lower than the top of that water level, then in theory it should come out. But if the hose goes up and then goes down... It's not going up, it's kind of flat. Yeah, you, you, it's not going to be much flow. You're kind of, you're going to need to kind of run that hose downhill five or ten feet to get much flow from it. So if, you, if your property is pretty flat and you're just going laterally out, then you may need to put a little booster pump on there or something. Okay, because I was like, it's full. Yeah. There should be pressure of water, because if you turn just the spigot itself, it comes flooding out. I wonder if you've got a blockage in your hose or something. Brand new hose. Huh. I don't know. Nothing's happening. Okay. Interesting. I'll try it on. Well, we're at time, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this, is, this class is about independent water systems and how to basically set up a water system where you are not dependent upon utilities or upon the system for your um, for your basic water needs. And just a, a bit of background, um, I'm Nick Meisner, I've been living off the grid up here in North Idaho for 20 some odd years. And uh, over the years we've come in contact with a lot of folks, filmed a lot of them for our DVDs, who had a variety of different water systems, came up with creative ways to solve these problems that we all deal with. 
And so I'm going to be sharing with you some examples today. Um, and uh, hopefully it's helpful. And if there's anything, you know, we'll try and get through any specifics that we can today. If we have time for Q&A, we'll do that. But if for whatever reason we don't, you can come over to our table. And I'm happy to chat water systems with you all afternoon. So um, anyhow, let's go ahead and get rolling here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Betty. Next one. So this is the typical country dweller's water system. Yeah, it may look a little different, different variations, but the general concept, the general idea is that you've got a well. Down in that well, you've got some sort of a pump. Most commonly, it's a submersible pump, which means the pump is way down in the well, towards the bottom of the well, pushing the water up. There's also jet pumps that could be sitting on the surface if the well is a shallow well and it sucks the water up. Whatever the case, though, it's an electric pump in that well, pushing the water over, it doesn't actually come out the top of the pump, I'm just a bad artist, but um, <laughs> it's going over underground so it doesn't freeze up, and it comes into your house, and somewhere along that line is a household diaphragm tank, it's commonly called a pressure tank or a bladder tank, and basically that tank is what keeps your water system pressurized when your pump is not running because you don't want your pump to have to be running all the time, but you would like to have water pressure all the time. And so with the typical system, the water pump turns on for a while, builds up the pressure, and then the water pump cuts off, and this keeps it pressurized in the meantime until you use some water and the pressure goes down. There's also some modern variable speed pumps. We won't get into all that, but basically they run whenever you open the water faucet. But same general idea. So the question is, okay, next slide. Next, the question is, what dependency does this kind of a system have? Power and electricity. Exactly, that electric pump, right? Yeah. That's the problem here. So, um, with the ultimate water system, uh, next slide. With the ultimate water system, there are five pieces of criteria that make up what I would consider to be the ultimate water system. Now. Not all of us are going to have all of these. In fact, most of us won't have all of these, but it's nice to kind of have an idea of what would be the ultimate. That's really helpful, especially when you're looking at a piece of land or a home or something like that. If you're already where you're going to be, then you make the best you can with what you've got. But here we go. So let's take a look at the next, the, these five. So first, no electricity required. That would be really nice. Second would be nothing mechanical to malfunction. That would be a very, because anything that's man-made can go wrong, right? <laughs> Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong at the worst possible time. Yeah. Okay. So, um, next would be good pressure at the house. Nice, be nice to, you know, not just have water barely seeping out. Be nice to have good pressure. And then plenty of quantity for not only your household needs, but also for irrigation of your garden and orchard and whatever you have going on, livestock or whatever. And finally, excellent quality of water, pure water. So these five pieces would be the ultimate water system. For, like I said, if you're where you're going to be and you don't have all of these, don't worry. We can typically work something out. We may have to fudge on this one and we may have to fudge on that one, but we typically don't want to fudge on these three. Make sense? Okay. So. First principle, let's take a look at the gravity principle, and this is something that we're going to be using whenever we possibly can, and that is the principle that for every one vertical foot of drop, when you, when you put water into a pipe and you run it uphill, for every one foot of vertical drop, you gain roughly 0.43 pounds per square inch of pressure, and that's something that we can use. So how does this work? So let's take a um, pipe. So let's take a 10-foot uh, stretch of pipe, and we're going to put a cap on this end. We're going to stick a hose in the top, fill it up. If you And so now if you've got 10 vertical feet, if you were to put a pressure gauge on the bottom here, it would read 4.3 pounds per square inch of pressure. So that's what we're talking about here. So our most common water system is a well, and that's what we're going to look at. We'll also look at some other uh, water sources but first, let's take a look at wells. So some important things you need to know about a well. We mentioned this earlier, but this is one of the most important things you need to know about your well, and that's the static water level. 
And as mentioned before, it, we're not talking about the overall depth of your well. We're talking about where that water settles out. So this could be 300 feet deep, and the static water level could be 50 feet. And so that is what is the really important measurement as far as depth. Because um, if we go ahead and put a pump in there, um, and go ahead and click to the next um, place, if we go ahead and put a pump in there, even though the pump is down here at the bottom of this well, it is not having to fight gravity up to this point. It's only having to fight this much gravity because the water inside that pipe equalizes with the water outside the pipe. And the effect is that you get a free ride up to this point. And so we're only fighting that much gravity, which is really, really handy. That's going to help us with, with a lot of things. So just bear that in mind. They're typically going to drill deeper and put the pump down at the bottom so that you have water standing on top of the pump, and that acts as a reserve. If your well doesn't yield a lot and it drops the water level as it's pumping, then this gives you some reserve on top of the pump. So that's a pretty common arrangement. Static water level is going to be an important thing you need to know. And the other really important piece of information about your well is the yield, how many gallons per minute. And so how do you find out this information about a well that's already been drilled? Well, if it has been drilled in recent years, by recent years, let's say in the last 20 or 30 years, then there should be a well log filed with the state. So here is what a well log looks like. This is Idaho Department of Water Resources. When the well driller drilled it, you should have filed this with the state, unless it was an off the books well, and then shh. <laughs> Be quiet about it. If it's not, if it's an off the books well. But if, if you have a well log, here's the static water level down here for this particular well, 54 feet. And also the yield up here, 7 gallons per minute. That's a good well. I'd be mighty pleased with that well. Um, 7 gallons a minute and 54 foot static water level. So, uh, one thing to bear in mind about well logs though, they are not always precisely accurate. Well drillers are not out there to get, they're not scientists out there trying to get everything precise. They're just, they're there to drill a well. And they're giving you rough estimates. So the yield in gallons per minute is often not very accurate. And static water level can vary over time. So can yield. Both of those can vary. If this was drilled 30 years ago, it could be a very different picture now. Other wells that were drilled near you can impact your well. Um, they could all be drawing from the same underground aquifer and have an impact. You have a neighbor that drills a well and pumps a ton of water out. I've, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this story of somebody had a great well and then a neighbor moves in, drills a well, and they've got dozens of impact sprinklers going 24-7 and now this person's well goes dry. It happens. And it's because we're all using from the same aquifers, and this doesn't apply just to the Rathdrum aquifer. This is this is something that this is something that a lot of people don't realize about underground water. This concept that it just runs in little tiny veins here and there—that's bogus. Most of the time, it's spread out in underground aquifers that are in layers of sand and rock and things like this. And so, if it's 10, 15. 30, 50, 100 acres in size, you could have multiple people tapping into that same little aquifer there. So just bear this in mind. Um, it can change. So if this is an old well, you might want to test it. You might want to check it out. How do you test it? Um, so that's a little bit of a bigger topic than I have time to jump into real quick, but there's such a thing called as a pump test. And that's really the most practical test that you need to know and that is running that pump full blast for at least 24 or 48 hours and see if it pumps the well dry. Basically, that's all you need to know. Who cares if it's 1,000 gallons a minute or 15 gallons a minute? All you need to know is, will the well keep up with my pump? If it keeps up with your pump, then you have, in theory, infinite water. You know, So that's the general idea. If you have any doubts, then run a pump test or have somebody run a somebody who knows what they're doing run a pump test for you. Ideally, you'd like to be monitoring the static water level while you're running that pump test so that you can see what's happening. 
and see if it stabilizes or is the static water level constantly going down, down, down while you're pumping out of that well. That's how you can get the most accurate idea of what's going on with your well now. So, moving on to an example. This is one that there's so many options, there's, there's a thousand different ways we could do this. I'm just going to throw out some options here. If you have a hill nearby, use that hill because we're going to tap into that gravity principle here. So what we're going to do, we're going to put a pump in that well, an efficient pump, that pump that is um, very energy efficient, perhaps pumps slowly, and we're going to bury a cistern uphill from the house at least 60 vertical feet if possible. You could get by with less, but that, that would be ideal to have normal household pressure. 60 feet up there, bury that cistern so it won't freeze up. And then what we're going to do is we are going to put in a alternative energy system to power that pump. If Once again, we're talking independent water systems here. So we're trying to get away from being dependent on the power company for our water. Mm -hmm. So we're going to power that pump with a alternative energy system. It could be a whole house system that you're running your whole house on, or it could be a small system that's just for your water pump, however you want to do it. You've got options, but you're going to power that pump with your alternative energy system, and that pump pumps the water up here, and then from here on down, gravity takes care of the rest. It takes it down to the house and pressurizes it. And this is a nice system because you've got a reserve up here, you don't have a pressure pump that you're having to run constantly whenever, when, you know, whenever your pressure tank runs out or something like that. You've just got this huge tank of water up here and you put a float switch in this cistern so that once the cistern fills up, it's not going to keep running that pump. And that's basically it. It's a, a good option if you have a hill nearby. So, let's go ahead and take a look at the next. And, oh, yeah, one thing I, I should mention is another option, another variation to this is going, we could go solar direct. Now, I don't typically recommend solar direct in a climate like ours up here because um, I, I live completely off the grid with the solar system. So I, I have nothing against solar. It's just that with solar direct, there's no battery backup. There's nothing. It's just whenever... Only when there's direct sunlight hitting those solar panels is that pump running. And in the winter months up here, that spells disaster, or that spells thirsty, actually. Um, so that's why I don't like that here. But if you end up in an area that gets more consistent sunshine year-round, then solar direct is certainly a viable option. You just want to make sure you've got lots and lots of capacity up here to carry you through any string of cloudy days that you might encounter. No, no plumbing on the second floor. Does that mean if you have a cistern, no, pl no well, second floor plumbing? Well, so, so the idea is if you want to have the normal household operating pressure of at least 20 or 30 PSI, then getting your cistern up 60 feet from the point of use is what it's going to take to get 20 or so, 20 to 30, I think that's roughly 30 PSI. And so the, I, the point of no plumbing on the second floor is, if you had plumbing on the second floor, then I'd change that to 70 feet up, you know. That's just the general idea that, it, and it doesn't have to be exactly 60 feet. If it was 40 feet, it'll still, the water will still flow, you'll still have pressure. It's just, it won't be quite as much pressure as you're used to in your house right now. Yes? Well, could you put a pressure tank there to get water to your second floor? Well, pressure tank is That's kind of where my house is, they have a pressure tank so I can get water up. It's the same system. Okay. The difference is that the pressure tank only works when you've got a pump that is capable of getting the pressure up higher. Mm -hmm. With this, you're never going to get the pressure any higher than what this 60 feet can do. So, you know what? Let me just think this through for a minute. If you're going to pump the pressure up, I love this. I always learn something every day. I think that. It's just 10 feet. You know, I don't think 10 feet is going to make a big difference, to be honest. But I, that's an interesting theory. I'll have to chew on that one. Yeah, because I live out by where you are. There. Mm -hmm. right? But anyway, yeah, mine's the same system there. They have a holding tank up above, and uh, I'm not completely off the grid also. Mm -hmm. But down below in my basement there, that's where they have the pressure tank. That's where my water's coming in there. Mm -hmm. And they got the pressure pump there. Mm -hmm. And of course, I got a second floor, you know, so mm -hmm. it's taking water all up to my <coughs> second floor also. 
Well, I mean, I've I've seen people that had a a tank in the attic of their house, and it would gravity flow down to the first floor. Was that 60 feet? By no means. It was you know 10 or 15 feet. Did they have normal pressure? No. But the water did flow. So it's really a matter of what you're willing to deal with. There's very few appliances out there that have to have a minimum amount of pressure. I think a uh, some of the tankless water heaters, right. I think, have to have 20 PSI, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to be conservative here with 60 you feet. Dishwashers? Possibly, possibly. Um, but, yes. you know, 40, 40 to 60 feet, and you should be good. Yes. Um, when your line is coming down there at the 60 feet, or actually at the second floor, would there be a problem with putting the T in there so that you would have pressure there no. and still flow by? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so let's move on here to another option if you don't have a hill nearby. So in this particular, this is for those of us with flat pieces of property. What do you do? So in this kind of a situation, once again, pump in the well, preferably a very energy efficient pump. Um, I'll just throw this one out because it's one of my favorites for, for a lot of scenarios, the Grenfoss SQ pump. Now this is not to be confused with the SQ Flex pump. The SQ Flex pump is a really expensive pump. It's awesome, but it's very expensive. The SQ pump is a pretty standard submersible pump, but it's soft start and it doesn't use a ton of power and it's just a good workhorse. I mean, um, my folks have used one for like 20 years, same pump, never had a, never had a bit of a problem with the thing. Um, so a good pump down in that well, pumping up to the house to a pressure tank, <coughs> household diaphragm tank. And basically, this is very similar to the conventional country dwellers water system. The difference is that with this particular system, we're going to be powering that pump with a alternative energy system. And it works fine. Uh, so you could keep it really simple like that. You don't have to have cisterns or anything. Uh, I do, if you have the hill nearby, I do like that other option, but if you don't have the hill nearby, this is great. Um, if you like having a reserve of water on hand, you could bury a cistern here and pump it out into the cistern and then pump it in there, but then you've got two pumps. Why have more mechanical pumps than you have to have? You know, that's just more things to go wrong. So that's one very simple way of, of doing this. So um, one thing that I do want to mention while we're talking about wells, is that every well needs a hand pump, if at all possible, unless your well is such that it's just incompatible with a hand pump. But if it's possible to use a hand pump on your well, then I highly recommend that you do that. Water is one of your basic necessities of life, and you've got to have a non-electric way, mechanical way of getting to that water. Um, I, I still like having the electric pump in there so you can have running water and all of that. I'm personally not into living Amish style yet until I have to. Um, but when the time comes, it's nice to have a backup where you can get out that water. So here's what you need to know about hand pumps. You've got a pipe that goes down into the well. Inside that pipe is a small pump rod that goes up and down. Down here at the bottom is what's called a cylinder. That's the pump. That's the actual pump. Here's, here's something that you need to know about pumps. Pumps push water way better than they pull it. Just think of a straw, a long straw, and you're trying to suck the water up. You can't suck it very far, can you? Even pumps um, are not able to suction water very far. I think it's like 12 feet, maybe 15 feet in an ideal world in a vacuum or something. But realistically, 12 feet, I think, is about the maximum that you can suction water up but pumps can push water up hundreds and hundreds of feet. So that's what we're doing here is this is the pump, and as you move that handle up and down, it's moving the pump rod up and down, which is activating that cylinder, and it's pushing the water up through this pipe and coming out the top. Now, with a lot of hand pumps, they require their... It's not like a immutable law, but just the as far as the amount of effort required and things like that, 200 feet is about the maximum for, for most of your conventional hand pumps out there. There are some, though, that can go a little deeper than that. Um, 
Russ, you mentioned the simple pump. It can go down roughly 320 feet, I think is what they say is the maximum. Realize, though, that if you're pumping water that deep, you're going to be working harder, and you're not going to get as much water per stroke. And same thing with the bison. I think the bison pump, and in fact, um, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. I'll show you a picture of both of these, but they can go down to 350 feet. Yes, sir. You what I struggle with is how do you prevent that from freezing? Okay, good question. Thanks for bringing that up. So, this is your um, your uh, casing or your uh, I'm trying to remember what it's right. called the pipe that's right. that the pump rod goes up and down inside. The water is in this pipe. That's what would freeze. Also up here would freeze. So what you do is you figure out what your frost level is, say three feet around here, something like that. You're going to drill a pinhole, I think it's like 1 16th of an inch, below, just below the frost level. And then what's going to happen is, while you're pumping, yes, you are going to be losing a little water out of that pinhole, but it's not that much. You're going to be more than overcoming it. And then as soon as you stop pumping, that little pinhole is draining, draining, draining the water down until it gets down below the frost level and nothing freezes up. Now that's provided it's not 40 below outside and this thing is out in the open. In that case, it's probably going to freeze up quicker than, you know, you're going to want to use some common sense with that. But in our typical temperatures that we've got up here, you should be good with that. It drains it down fairly quickly, you know, within a, I don't know, what is your take, Russ? A, a I never really tied it, but the thing about the hydrant, you get, everybody has a hydrant in New York, okay, and yeah. it, it just drains hydrant. right out. It's the right. same principle right. as the frost-free hydrants in New York. Yeah. So that's how you deal with that. Let me play you a little clip on... Um, hand pumps so you can see one in action. This is kind of one of the old school ones right here. I purchased from Lehman's catalog, out of Lehman's catalog. It's one of their, if you want to say, one of their heavier duty pumps because my pump, or my well, is uh, about 320 feet deep. Uh, and so with that it takes, you've got, it takes a bigger pump You've got more of your pump rod and so forth in there. And as you can see, I'll pump here a little bit. It takes about three to four good pumps to get water. And I have timed this out, and I can pump about five gallons of water in approximately five minutes. Now this, like I say, with this, particular uh, pump here, you have to put a lot, pretty good effort in there because you're having to pull the water and you're having to pull uh, your pump rods up. So you've got to exert quite a bit of energy. But it's better than not having any water at all. <laughs> That's for sure. So uh, one thing to correct there, he mentioned the overall depth of his well. He got confused. As we discussed earlier, it's not about how deep your well is, it's about the static water level. His static water level, if I recall right, is about 120 feet. So if that gives you an idea of what you could expect at 120 feet. Now, let me show you a couple of what I consider to be better options than the old clunker cast iron ones. The Bison is a really heavy duty, nice stainless steel pump made in Maine. And they've got options that can go down to 350 feet static water level. At that depth, they'll do a longer handle, and it's a heavier duty head, and all that sort of thing, but it is possible. And then Simple Pump, they are able to go down to, I think, 325 feet, something like that, and they use lighter weight materials. I believe it's like fiberglass, or is it fiberglass rods? Anyway, it's lighter weight I, materials. I, I've rods. got aluminum handle, and everything else is stainless, if I recall. But the rods, I believe. The ro right. Oh, the rods are PVC. Uh, Okay, the, yeah, the, the outer casing is BBC and then it's, yeah, it is a fiber and less metal yeah. tip. And that's one way that they're able to get deeper depths out of it is by making the apparatus lighter weight because the more of more weight you have to pick up and down, that's the limiting factor here. The pump, you, you hook these up to a windmill and they can go hundreds of feet deeper, but that's because the windmill, if you have enough wind, is a lot stronger. It's got gears and all of that to gear it down and, and really move it. So the pump is not the limiting factor, you are. That's, that's the general idea here. And so um, just be aware of both of these. Now, talking just, I'm just going to be realistic here. As far as price, you can expect to spend two to $3,000 on a 
hand pump, depending on the depth of your static water level. If you've got shallow static water level, then it's less than that. If you've got a deep, you know, if you're 300 feet static water level, then you might pay a little more than that, but that gives you an average idea of what you're going to spend on the, on the materials for the hand pump. Okay, let's take a look at springs real quick. We do have some springs. I have a question. Oh, yes, um, is the hand pump um, 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 close to the other pump or uh, is it a separate? Yeah. So good, good question. I should have mentioned this. Let me go back. Okay, so what happens is, and the manufacturer will tell you what size of casing you need in order to fit alongside, but the idea is ideally you'd like for both of these to be able to be they're not necessarily going to be side by side like this. It's going to be more like this. The hand pump cylinder is going to be up higher. The, the electric pump is going to be down here. But still, you've got these two pipes going side by side. And so you need to have enough casing width to handle that. So ideally, six inch casing would be what most hand pump manufacturers are going to want. If you have less than that, however, Bison does have an option where they can actually tap into the pump that's going down to your electric submersible pump and use that for the hand pump. And that one does have some drawbacks. It's not ideal, but it can work if that's what you've got for your casing. So there's options, but they'll, with all of these companies, basically they'll have a form that they want you to fill out where you measure things on your well. The width of the casing, inside and outside, and stuff like that. Send it in to them, and then they will let you know what options they have that will work with your particular well. Mm -hmm. If your electric pump uh, needs to be replaced, and you've got a hand pump installed, you'd have to pull all the hand yep. pump fly yep. out first. Before Most before. likely, yep. Yep. Pros and cons to everything in life. <laughs> okay, springs. So, as, uh, as you all are likely aware, we do have some springs up here in this area. Uh, this is one possible way. This is what I consider to be the ultimate water system. And that's if you were to have a hill nearby, you had a spring well up that hill, you collected that water, protected it from surface contamination, ran it into a cistern that's buried, and if that cistern was able to be at least 60 vertical feet, once again, like we discussed earlier, this is give or take some, it's, it's still going to flow even if it's 30 feet, but you get the idea. If it, cistern uphill from the house, gravity takes care of everything, there's nothing electrical, nothing mechanical, it's, it's a beautiful mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Now, there aren't too many people that have this as an option, so don't feel like you're, you've, you're just, you've got a terrible system if you don't have this. I'm just saying this is the ultimate. So you know what it looks like, and if you happen to be looking for a property and you find something where a spring is far enough uphill where you could do something like that, that is awesome. It's totally awesome. But you don't have to. Beware of crawdads. Ask but, me how I know. They <laughs> <laughs> come out of the spring out of the pipe. Wait, it's, what was the first thing? In North Carolina, Black Mountain. Mm -hmm. Okay, had that same set up there, had, uh, but there were crawdads up there in the oh, spring. Oh, crawdads, okay. <laughs> okay. and they got into the pipe going down. Yeah. Yeah, it gets interesting. Yeah, screens are a good yeah. idea. And you want to be able to Found access the spring head so that you can clean leaves and debris and stuff like that out, things like that. Anyhow, okay, so let's move on to what do you do if the cistern, if you're not able to get the cistern at least 60 feet up. So let's say you could only get it 10 or 20 feet above your house. Um, then it's pretty simple. You can put in a very low power booster pump. It makes some DC powered booster pumps that could run straight off your batteries from your alternative energy system. Use very little power and they'll just boost the pressure up and voila, there you go. That's, and, and the beautiful thing that's about this kind of a setup is if your booster pump or your power system went out, the water would still flow. You just wouldn't have the amount of pressure that you're used to. So I like having redundancy, and that's that's really nice. So, okay, let's take a look real quick at spring number one, and this will give you an idea of what a quarter of a gallon per minute spring looks like. And you might be surprised, quarter of a gallon per minute sounds like not much, and it's true, it's a slow spring, but you can actually do a good bit with it. So let's take a look at this real quick. One thing about this reservoir 
is this reservoir has an overflow. And in the overflow, the water flowing out of this will tell you how much water is actually flowing in. Because it's going to be constant. If I was to put a cup under here, I may get two cups, maybe three cups a minute. I've done the math. If you get two cups of flow in a whole minute, 24 hours a day, you've got enough to take care of your family. So if you've just got a little trickle, do not be upset if you haven't got a three-gallon or a four-gallon spring. Those are something to brag about. You don't need that much. This is all you need right here. Because remember, it works for you when you sleep, when you're not here, when you're here, 24 hours. Now, one area where I would have to disagree with him slightly is that's true if all you're worried about is your domestic water needs. That's not true if you've got to do any sort of irrigation. Or livestock. So, but, or livestock, exactly. So, yes, it doesn't take that much water for a household. Um, you know, I think USDA says 50 gallons per person per day. I think a lot of homes use a little more than that, but that gives you a, a rough idea of, of domestic use. Um, but I just want you to see how little water it can take to support your your home. Now, for irrigate, and because see that adds up to 360 gallons per day because you're collecting every bit of that water. So um, when you hear a quarter of a gallon per minute, if you're thinking in terms of a well, that would be a terrible well, absolutely terrible well. But with a spring, you're collecting every bit of it, so it actually adds up to a. a a workable amount, you know, a sizable amount. And you can even do some irrigation with it. It's just you're not going to be able to do extensive irrigation with it. You're going to have to be really careful. So what I'd rather you get into, if, if at all possible, is something more along the lines of this spring. Here's what 1.3 gallons per minute looks like. So we take the screen off. And... We get my wash and stop wash mode here, and here we go. Okay, I read forty four seconds. So that's about one point three gallons per minute, and even that, that's not a huge gusher, is it? But that adds up to between 18 and 1900 gallons per day. That's a tidy sum of water. You could do a lot with that. Mm -hmm. So just be aware, um, yes, a gallon per minute would be really nice. But um, you know, it is possible to make it work with less. But just, it just depends on how much irrigation you're going to need to do. So how do you develop a spring head? Well, here's a kind of a synopsis of our DVD spring head development. Yesterday, when we dug this spring out, we had to clear the weeds off and dig along the ditch, trace the spring to its source, and then dig out a basin. We put in gravel and a collection pipe. Then we put in more gravel. We closed it back over with plastic. Then we put dirt on top. And now, as you can see, it's all covered over. When we get grass planted on this and growing, there will not even be any evidence that there's a spring under the ground there, and it will be protected from runoff and from contamination. I have had the opportunity through the past 20 years or so to put in at least 10 springs, or head up 10 springs in this, with this kind of a method, and there has never been any problem in any of those springs so far. I believe that this is a very reliable way to head up a spring, help to keep out contamination, and to allow collection of the vein of water and to keep it channeled where you can use it. So that's the quick and short of one method for developing a spring head. It works really well. Some people are tempted to use concrete, and I would suggest that you not do that because water can often figure out a way to undermine the concrete. Use good old clay. There's nothing like clay for, for damming up the spring, for heading it up. So um, that would be one suggestion I have. Okay, let's take a look at creeks really quick, streams. We're now getting out of the realm of groundwater and we're getting into surface water. This is a whole other animal. This surface water can be very useful, but I want to give you some cautions about surface water. The most obvious one, of course, would be purity. We're, since it's now 
exposed to the surface, it's liable to be contaminated from any number of things, whether it be animals upstream, whether it be what have you, the chemicals in the air, whatever. Um, it's not protected. And so I would give you a big uh, caution about using surface water for your household needs. It can be done, plenty of people do up here. And if there was anywhere that I would use surface water, it would be up here. There's a lot of parts of the country where I wouldn't want to touch, I don't even want to swim in the water, let alone use it in my house. But um, you, can, you, a lot of people do get away with doing it. Um, use a tabletop filter to filter their drinking water, that sort of thing. So you could certainly do that. But um, just, just a word of caution about that. Now, a creek or a stream is typically going to be below your house. It's not usually going to find a creek that's above your house. So this is one really interesting creative way of utilizing creek water, and that's using a ram pump, which if you've never heard of a ram pump before, they're quite the ingenious devices. I'll show you a clip of one in just a minute. But basically a ram pump takes the energy from gravity pushing water downhill. Remember we were talking about the gravity principle. For every foot you gain 0.43 pounds per square inch. Well, the ram pump takes the energy from that pressure that builds up and uses the energy from this drop here to pump the water uphill much further than that. So like if you had 10 feet of drop here, 10 feet of head, it could pump the water uphill potentially 100 feet. Um, quite quite fascinating device. The byproduct is that only a portion of the water that comes down this drive pipe will actually make it up here. But most of the water gets sprayed out as part of the pumping process. From here gravity pushes it down to the house and pressurizes it. So this is a nice system. Ram pumps are, if you get a good quality one, they're very reliable, completely non-electric. They're just purely mechanical. They've been known to run for decades and decades uh, and um, here's a picture of one right here. This is uh, Rife Ram. Rife is the best known ram pump company out there. I'm not even sure if there are any other cast iron ones, but R I F E. And here's a video, uh, just a short video clip of a ram pump in action. So you can see most of the water gets sprayed out, only a portion of the water is going up through that pipe and making it up to the cistern uphill. But I've heard of these things, I heard of a guy that was up in the, up in the mountains walking around and he heard some kind of a weird noise underground and he started digging around and come to find out some old miner 30, 40 years before had set up a ramp up and buried it and it was still working, still <laughs> so amazing. But this would not work if you were in a low yield situation. So you would not typically use a ram pump with a spring unless it was a real gusher of a spring. It's typically going to be used with a creek where you've got plenty of water and you don't need nearly the amount of water that it can. If we see a, a, a if we see a, a spring outlet, is there a way short of just like he was timing how much goes in there. Is there anything that we can see how, what the pressure is? You have to develop the spring to, to see the amount of flow. Well, I'm, I'm thinking there's, there is, up on the Clerk Road outside of Old Town, mm. there is a free spring 24-7 all year round, and it is a gusher. Mm. Now you can fill a five-gallon bucket in less, less than a minute. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, is there any way to know how fast it is or how, how strong that is. The only, the so is. if you're talking about pressure, then yeah, you can either measure the number of vertical feet, like I have a little hand level that I can look through and it's got a bubble in it, and, and you measure the distance up to your eye level, and then you see how many times you work your way up the hill in increments and see how far it is up there, and then you can calculate how many uh, feet and calculate that into pounds per square inch of pressure. The other option is put a pressure gauge down at the bottom and see how many PSI it is. But I guess I'm thinking that you're talking about flow, how much yeah. flow. And really the only way to know about a spring is to develop the thing. Because you can look at it, and but a lot of times 
you're going to actually get more water than what meets the eye on the surface. Because once you get in there and develop it, it could potentially be more than what you're seeing just right now on the ground. But and that can vary. What's that? And that can vary in the course yeah, of the year. Yeah, exactly. And that's the other thing is, and this is um, something that I'm going to mention at the end, but there's mentioning a couple of times, you always want to check the flow of your water source during the driest time of the year. And springs are definitely more of a variable water source than groundwater. And there's a lot of springs that go dry in the summer. Um, those are just from spring runoff, you know, wet weather springs, basically. So especially with springs, you want to check it and if at all possible, check it in August, September, sometime around then, to make sure that it's a year-round spring. Or see if you can, if there's a neighbor around that can verify that, oh yeah, this thing's always, always wet. But um, that was one thing that, that we did before, we, we lived with the spring, and we, want, we checked it. We waited to make an offer on the property until we were able to check it in the dry season because it can fluctuate a lot. Okay, so, real quick, word about rainwater. So, while rainwater can be a valuable asset as an addition to your, uh, to your operation, if you've got a slow water source or something like that, I never recommend rainwater as your primary water source. It's just too variable it, you know, what do you do during a drought? That's the one, that's the biggest question in my mind. What could you do during a drought? And in our part of the country, we typically have a drought every summer, you know, from <laughs> July, August, September-ish, plus or minus. Is it feasible to actually store up three months of water for your entire home? Can you imagine how large of a cistern you would have to have? That boggles my mind. So. Uh, only as a supplement is what I would say, and um, yeah, I, the other thing is, I, you call me a conspiracy nut if you want, but I kind of worry about the rainwater quality with all the chemtrails up in the sky, you know? I, I'd rather have that water after it's filtered through the ground so I've gotten mm -hmm. some of that junk out of it. So, because I, I have no idea what's in that stuff. Or so, how about simply just what's on your roof? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, your, your roofing materials may not be, but they may be putting off chemicals, may be toxic, yeah. So, okay, real quick, final checklist. Always, always, always test your water source uh, before drinking. Have a good, good lab, test it. There's one in Spokane, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of it. You can do a Google search. There's labs, various places. Accurate Labs in Coeur d'Alene. Oh, yeah, here's the man to talk to you about. Home that. Inspector. <laughs> What's the name of it? Accurate Lab. Accurate, Accurate lab. Labs in Coeur d'Alene. Okay. Uh, yeah, right near where they have the farmer's market uh, around Hayden area. Okay, cool. And then second, if possible, if at all possible, check the water source during the driest time of the year. Make sure it's year-round and producing sufficient quantity for your needs, even during the driest time of the year. And if the amount of water is questionable, persist in looking for a better water setup. And I can't stress that enough. you got to have water. You simply have to have water. There's no way around it. And then finally, use your ingenuity. Use your God-given ingenuity. Usually some solution can be worked out. As long as there's enough water there, we can usually work something out. You know. And so, like I said, over at our uh, table, happy to chat through with you your particular system if you've got an unusual thing and, and you want to discuss it or whatever. And I just I have a few more minutes. I don't see Don anywhere, so I think I'm good. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, um, <laughs> let's keep rolling here. So uh, just a quick word about finding water. So this is a topic that we often get questions about from folks looking to buy a property. And, and they're like, what do I do? How do I, how do I know if there's water on the property? Well, obviously with surface water, it's pretty obvious that you are going to check during the driest time of the year. And um, if, if you are talking about a spring, I already mentioned this, it's possible that there could be more water than what's visible there. You're going to just need to develop it to really get a, a good feel for what is there. 
but you know it's pretty self-evident what water is there as long as you check it during the dry season. The tricky one is groundwater. What do you do about groundwater? So first step would be to check the well logs in the immediate vicinity around that property. And when I say that, I'm, I'm looking not just at proximity, but I'm also looking at the, the lay of the land. Is it a pretty consistent strata? Like, is, is this a plateau or a plain, and these other wells are in that same plateau or plain? That's what I'm looking for, because you could have a well that's not very far away, but if it's way down in the bottom of a valley and you're way up here, there could be very different results. So we're looking for similar placement of the well logs, and this is there's a QR code for you if you pull out your phone. That'll take you to the Idaho Department of Water Resources website where it actually has a map, and you can just zoom into that map and it'll show you all of the well logs that they have on record. And so there you can see, get an idea of when those wells were drilled, what the flow was, and what the static water level was. As we've already mentioned, though, take that with a big grain of salt. These well logs are not always accurate, and they can change over time. But it's a place to start. Yes. One thing, too, is if you're looking for property, especially around this area, real estate agents will tell you if there's a spring on the property, because that's a selling point, for because they know people are looking for that. So I know I've talked to a couple people that specifically told the realtors, yeah, I'm looking for something that has a spring. and. They typed it in, and it was a key word that just popped up properties. I would, I would though, beware about realtors telling you that this property has something, because they tend, we are, realtors are salesmen. You know? Right, but it's a starting point. Yeah, and, and I would like to think, you know, that I think most of them are have integrity and would not be intentionally lying to somebody, but they also may not be necessarily doing due diligence to give you accurate information. They may just look during the springtime and say, oh yeah, there's a spring. So yeah, it's a spring. Yeah, and you, you have no idea. So, you, so buyer beware. But yeah, good point. Good point. So that's one option. Um, that's the place to start. Now beyond that, what do you do if you don't have some good comparables? If you don't have well logs that are nearby in a very similar strata, you don't, and I'm also looking for consistent results. Even if I've got a bunch of well logs if I'm getting very inconsistent results where some were gushers and some were dry, then it's like, man, that's, this really isn't helping me much. I'm looking for consistency here. All the wells in this area are consistent. Um, so that's where this becomes really helpful. So then another option that some people will turn to is dousing because they have nothing, they, have, they know of nothing else. The, for whatever reason, the well drilling industry does not seem to have much motivation for locating water under the ground beforehand. I don't know what the reason why is. Is it because it's? Is it because they would they'd rather just drill where it's easier to park their truck? Um, you know, I'm, honestly, I have I have heard from a number of well drillers that I believe were being honest that if asked where's the best place to drill a well, they'd say easiest place to park my truck. They don't know where the water is. Um, and so dousing, I, I do have a few words about this. I know it's kind of a controversial topic. Wherever you stand on dousing as a principle, from the practice of the matter, even well drillers are very split on whether it even works. I've heard from very large well drilling outfits that say that they've experimented with it and they got results about 50% of the time. I've seen studies that sounded, you know, I've seen studies both sides of the coin. Dr. Wittner? Yeah, Wittner. That, that's the, the PR, the PC word for dousing. Um, but it's, there's, it's very inconsistent. It's not repeatable. It depends on who's doing it. If one person does it, they get one thing, and another person does it if they don't have whatever it is that they're supposed to have, well, it's then a belief it, system it doesn't system. work. Yeah, it, it's it like, and, and nobody can explain it. Nobody can scientifically explain how it works. Listen to Dr. Noyce. So, what's that? Listen to Dr. Noyce and what he mm -hmm. has to say about it. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think that most people are taking it to that length, yeah. but um, my point is, however you stand on dousing itself, my understanding 
is that it's not reliable. Um, you know, it works sometimes for some people, and so if you want to trust that, to, to if you want to risk thirty thousand dollars drilling a well based upon that, whatever. That, I wasn't really happy with that. Um, so I actually happened upon we did some research on this, and because we were going to be drilling a well, and I was not wanting to risk a bunch of money on that. And so we found that there actually is technology that was developed uh, in conjunction with the oil industry where they can actually locate fluids underground, um, deep fluids underground. And um, so, yeah, this is really interesting stuff. We, we actually, we were so impressed with this that we actually um, invested in getting the equipment. And um, so we're actually going to start trying this stuff out and, um, this year and, and see how it works, but I've heard of really consistent results that get very reliable results can um, can uh, determine how many feet down, how, many, how deep you're going to have to drill to hit the aquifer, and a rough estimate on how many gallons per minute you might expect, plus or minus 20% accuracy, which to me was pretty acceptable. So anyhow, here's if you're interested in that, um, here's a website that you can go to, and I'm happy to connect with you, get more info. Like I said, this is new to us. We're just getting our feet wet with this, and so we're going to be doing a lot of experimenting this year and satisfying ourselves that it works, but a lot of other people in other parts of the country have been using this with really good success, and we're actually going to be using it for ourselves. We got it for ourselves to start out with. And, um, so stay, uh, we'll uh, keep you in the loop on, on how it turns out. Um, so you should, yeah, do you remember, I've got eight minutes. Awesome. Do you remember the uh, Ellen White up in California when they had, uh, she had that fellow come dousing and they, they found that they found the guy found the water mm -hmm. and he said at the time everything was running dry that's why they were able to get the, the property so cheap and they didn't have any water and they came back later on and they said you get you have plenty of water you know mm -hmm. so anyway but there's I was gonna say there's a fellow back in my hometown Kansas I'm, I'm a farm boy and um, when I was younger this fellow came out Larry F., he was good I mean very good he would come out and he would he, you'd have to be quiet. He'd concentrate. He'd walk, and he'd take he'd take the same thing. You wouldn't have to be a well, you know, breath. But he'd take a breath. He'd walk up, and after he after he downs, he found water. He would he would stand there, and then this thing would, would, would start going around in a circle like this, and his hands spin around, and he would tell you how how deep you have to go, and where he would have us on our property there. It was right there. Well, like I say, it's a controversial topic, yeah. and um, you know everybody's got a different point of view. But and I guess I've got a weird mind. But if I can't explain it, and if it's not repeatable, yeah, and if right. different people can get different results with it, then mm -hmm. I'm not willing to risk thirty thousand right, dollars on it. But I hear you. You know, <laughs> he you, did, brother. He did for free. For you hear a lot of anecdotal stories that. about it. Yeah. And so it's something. Anyhow. Um, Real quick, yes. just want to contribute one thing uh, that one of our great concerns, of course, aside from drinking water, is being able to grow things. Right. And something that's not known about much, I've really been giving classes and teaching people about it, is called the Cratch Key Method of Hydroponics. And I really, I, I really think it'd be great if anybody write that down. K R A T K Y. Look it up. It's a uh, professor out in the University of, uh, of, of Hawaii. And basically what I've done is I've planted tomato plants and grown it in five gallons of water for the season. Hmm. Okay. Can you and spell that one more time? K-R-A-T-K-Y. Kratky hydroponics. Not ebb and flow, it's not you know all that mechanical stuff. It, it's I'm happy to talk to people afterwards or whatever, but it, it could be a lifesaver. Cool. Not Thanks. just tomatoes. Appreciate that very much. Okay, just a few words about hot water while we're on the topic of water. Um, do I have five minutes? Or? No? Oh, perfect. Okay, so you want to talk about hot water? See me at my table. <laughs>